Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm gonna get just, I'm still admitting people. I'm gonna give it another minute or two to just keep letting people join. But we're really excited to have you here tonight. Okay, well, I'm going to get started. And um, if Levi, our co-host, if you could continue to admit people while I'm talking, because I might not notice it. Um, so Thank you everyone so much for joining us today. Um, I'm Sarah Chapman and I'm the executive director of the nonprofit Media Burn Archive, which is based in Chicago. Media Burn collects, preserves, and distributes documentary video produced by artists, activists, and community groups. Our mission is to use archival media to deepen context and encourage critical thought through a social justice lens. If you're not familiar with our work, Make sure to head over to mediaburn.org to watch thousands of hours of streaming videos and to follow us on email or social media to find out about future events like these. Um, this is the second event in an ongoing series of virtual talks with video activists. Um, and today we're pleased to present a screening and discussion with Eleanor Boyer. Eleanor came to video in the mid 1970s when portable video was first available to individuals outside the broadcast profession. Eleanor sought to promote cultural and institutional change by educating people about the issues affecting women's place in society. The focus of her work was to show the realities of women's lives and to provide realistic alternatives to female stereotypes that dominated the mass media. Her videos have been used for educational and informational purposes in social service agencies, schools, and universities. They appeared in film festivals, art galleries, and in broadcasts on local TV stations and cable TV. Her, week, her work has been screened at Chicago's National Museum of Mexican Art and included in major exhibitions at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago and the Art Institute of Chicago. Eleanor has prepared a 30 minute compilation of some of her works for this event. Abridged versions of three videos will be shown. The first two, Getting Strong, Self-Defense for Women, completed in 1976, and Rugby Women, made in 1978, were shot on half inch black and white videotape with the first generation portable video equipment, the Sony Portapack. The third video, Festival de Mujeres, was shot in 1979 on three quarter inch videotape using an early generation color three quarter inch video cassette recorder and camera. It was made by Eleanor together with video maker Karen Pugh. Um, so the screening is going to be about 30 minutes um, and then we're going to come back and you can talk with Eleanor, ask her questions. And um, so whenever you want to do that, you can do that by use, writing your question in the chat and we will read it out loud. Or you can um, raise your hand either sort of virtually, there's a button to raise your hand, or you can like raise your hand literally and we'll, um, we'll help you get unmuted and ask your question out loud if you prefer that. Um, so I think Eleanor was going to wait to speak until afterwards. Um, so we will just get going with the screening. And again, Zoom screenings can be difficult. So if there are technical difficulties, bear with us. We're going to try to move through them as quickly as possible. But we hope it'll be a smooth show for you tonight. So um, enjoy. go out alone at night no very seldom I mean uh, unless I'm in a cab or something you know I never walk alone why because I'm afraid afraid of what of people being attacked being robbed uh, other things you know things that uh, getting grabbed uh, my sister almost got raped and uh, I'm scared of being grabbed in alleys and stuff like that do you ever go out alone at night? No. Why not? Because I'm afraid. 
Afraid of what? Getting stuck up by rate. I think it's a shame. Why do you think it's a shame? Drug violence in the streets and what have you. The ladies aren't protected. Do you have any suggestions of what could be done about it? Stronger police. The ladies ought to be more careful. How can the women be more careful? Try to avoid going in bad neighborhoods. Try to avoid going out at night. Do you ever have reason to go out at night? No. Well, sometimes, but I don't go by myself. I'm too smart. <laughs> Do you take along a man friend? Always, if I go out by myself at night. If a man attacked you, do you and you were alone, do you think you would be able to defend yourself? No, I'd probably be scared to death, I think. I don't know. I've never been in that position, so I don't know. It's hard to talk to me. Mm -hmm. Whereas a woman can't defend herself as easily as a guy could probably do. Why do you think that is? Uh, because uh, women are soft and nice, you know, and guys are, you know, a man is stronger than a woman, obviously, you know, for size. If a man came up from behind you and grabbed you and threatened to hurt you and you saw that you had an avenue of escape, do you think you could call it upon yourself to hurt him, to hit somebody in an instance like that if you were threatened? If I were threatened, probably, yeah. But not having ever been confronted, I'm not sure what I would do. Besides probably faint. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd do that either, so. She wouldn't faint. No. <laughs> do you think it would be helpful for women to take a course in self-defense? For myself, no. But for somebody else, it it probably be all right. I'm very frightened. Afraid of what? Of uh, more or less being molested or raped or terrorized in some kind of way. A lady just cannot walk on the streets nowadays without being so, you know. If you were attacked, do you think you could successfully defend yourself or fight off an attacker? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No way. Do you think you're just not strong enough to do it? Well, yes, I think I'm not. Yeah. Do you think that if you took a course in self-defense, you might be able to fight off an attacker? I don't know. Usually when I get scared, I get weak all over. I don't know. I might pass out of anything. I don't know. I don't think so. So if someone were, all of a sudden you became aware that someone was following you on the street, what do you think you would do? Jesus Christ. I I never thought about it. Most less, most likely, I would run. <laughs> I'll try to run at least. Um, a woman should be with me. Why with you? Night. I can protect her. Don't you think women should be trained to protect themselves? I don't care about you know. Not really. They need a man. Self-defense instructor Carol Whiteside. Most of them come to the self-defense classes right out of the fear that they feel being on the street. Some of them are only uneasy yet. They haven't become terrified. Others might have even had some kind of experience where they recognized the chance to take care of themselves was there and they didn't know how to do it. Most of them feel themselves to be completely ineffectual at taking care of themselves, especially when they consider that most of the people attacking them are going to be bigger and stronger. A lot of women express the fact that they're afraid to hurt somebody else. They pull their punches. They don't let themselves go. They don't feel like they have the right somehow to hurt somebody else, even if that somebody else might be hurting them. So all these attitudes come into what women bring to a class. The fear, the inadequacy, the inability to be strong and aggressive. Are women really the weaker sex? Oh, I think women definitely are the weaker sex because we've been taught to be the weaker sex. And this has some very real consequences. From the time where high school students were not included in a lot of the physical sports, we don't feel strong. Socially, we're passive. We're socialized into being passive. We don't ask men for dates. They're supposed to ask us. Any woman who's aggressive is looked on as unfeminine. We're subject to harassment in the streets by men who are making comments on our sexual beings. And this is expected to be taken as a compliment, because after all, women are supposed to be sexual beings. On the other hand, we're not supposed to respond to this in any way, because again, being aggressive is unladylike. One of the major consequences of this, of course, is a real fear of being in the street, being alone, being without that male protection that we're taught to need and want. The rape statistics these days show that that's a real problem. And one of the things that women have to learn to do, in my opinion, is to be able to handle themselves in the street, take care of themselves, and fight. As I said, fighting is not considered a ladylike thing to do. And I think that our, 
question is going to be have to going to have to be how to redefine then being ladylike, because I think it's possible to be a tender, loving, warm person and still be able to take care of yourself. The question is whether the rest of the society will ever support that. What usually happens? People see in the movies, right? They grab her on the waist and she beats on his chest like this, and of course it doesn't work. Well, anyone who's in a position like this has left all this head area open. You can push in the throat, the hollow of the throat, very effective, half let go. You can hit with the side of your hand. You can gouge to the eyes if you want. You can rake your fingernails across the face. Anything like that. You know, it's very effective. Same from the back. From the back, if your hands are out, you can sort of reach back with your elbow and hit them, hit them in the neck, what, like that. Okay, then you can step down on the instep and step down, turn around, and follow through with a kick if you want, or a knife hand. If for some reason you do happen to get down on the ground, you want to keep your knees up to your chest. The reason for that is it's very hard to get down and attack a person in this position. Now, if I were to grab her on the neck, she would go for the fingers and bend them back. Now, if I'm trying to get the knees apart like this, my head area is open. You can go in with a knife hand to the neck, gouge to the fingers, or to the eyes. Like that, you're in a very bad position. Now, even if a person is really wrestling with you and struggling, if you can, get a foot in there. <laughs> if you think that you can't do it, you're defenseless from that from that moment. But if you have some knowledge that, you know, well, he's not going to push me around. I know something. Mm -hmm. I can jab him. I can kick him. You know, mm -hmm. then you probably even have an kind of an aura around you that makes you look less attackable. You even know? even the weakest person, uh, the shortest person, can find out that there are some things that they can do to protect themselves. They might not be able to do. Um, flips or something like that and you throw somebody over their shoulder. But there are things that they can do to protect themselves and I think they don't know it. What happens when women take self-defense classes in my experience has been that they begin to get a whole lot more confident not only about themselves and being able to take care of themselves but about their role in society as a whole, about their rights and their ability to take their place in the world as something other than always subservient, passive and dependent. Now what happens often is that when a woman starts doing more and the society out there hasn't changed at all is that she sets herself up for some more problems. More women have run into possible problem situations as they've begun to be more aggressive and assertive socially out of feeling more aggressive and assertive about taking care of themselves. Mm -hmm. If nothing else, sometimes women get into a situation where they can act stronger but they are thereby then deliberately challenged by men. We have no right to stand up for ourselves like that and we're really going to be shown there are a bunch of men out there who just want to show us. Now, often these happen to be people who are very close to us, brothers, fathers, boyfriends. They're the ones who are convinced that we couldn't possibly be as strong as we think we are. We couldn't possibly be as capable as we think we are. So what we have to do is change society itself, and that means changing men's attitudes also. I think that every time there's a self-defense class in a high school or a junior high for women, there should also be some kind of session for men where they can begin to talk about what their attitudes are towards women and towards women taking these self-defense classes. The whole thing has to be taken very seriously by both sides or we're never going to be able to change those fundamental power differences between men and women that cause the difficulty in the first place. Have you, have you seen women's rugby games out no, here before? No, uh -huh. Think you might It's watch the first it? time we've had women's rugby. Uh -huh. Oh, when are you playing here again? Um, I really don't know when they'll be playing again. Well, I know you practice here. Yeah. You want to practice? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you think about it? Some of the girls are cute. <laughs> what about their skill? They have good legs. 
I noticed you over here working out. And I was just curious, so I came over to see what's happening. It's all right, though, women. Hey, first time for everything, huh? That's so good. When I announced that I was going to start another club and asked around, I found several other people that were graduating from Illinois and were moving to Chicago that were interested in playing. And they came right away to help start it. And there was one person that came from the Chicago club to help start the new club. So it certainly wasn't myself doing it alone. I don't think I could have handled that. Keep your shoulder on here. <laughs> I know, I don't you mean up. to stop. <laughs> you got to put your weight on her. It's going lower. Okay, okay trust us. Okay. Put your legs back. Oh, okay. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Easy, easy. Oh, <laughs> that looks good. Is this right? I'd be really nervous just going to the practice, you know. Em and I'd be here in the car together talking and, and um, and I would just be really just kind of tight in the stomach sort of feeling just going to practice and wondering, was I going to get hit this time, both my legs broken, you know, what was it going to happen? But um, I guess, I guess it was last week or something that we tackled for the first time, ma'am. I can't remember. I think after that, I don't think about being tackled and it hurting anymore. You have a lot of people, a lot of trouble with people getting comfortable with contact with other women. Because well, men have had all the wrestling and the football and basketball, which is practically contact, that they have been touching each other, and women haven't ever touched each other. And that's a real mental trip to go through. I feel somehow that it's weird or unnatural to be touching a woman. Yeah. And unfortunately, they don't verbalize it. If they could just come to us and try and talk about it, we've been through the same thing. We can really empathize with those uneasy feelings. The first time I had to put my hand up between someone's legs and grasp onto it's their the waistcoat. It's the strangest feeling in the world. It I really mean, is. It really took me back. It takes your breath away, and you're, you're just sort of like, it's like you want to, it's like you say, uh, uh, I'm not sure this game is for me, and you do want to just sort of turn and run across the field, you know? And unfortunately, some of them have to do that and then don't come back. Practice goes really well. We spend all our time doing things and we have very little time to talk to each other and really get to know each other. So the bar afterwards is a good time when we can just talk about practice and learn about each other and have a couple drinks together. And I think that's one of the places where you really get a feeling of being a team. Plus three, six plus six, and everybody knows that a rug twist sticks out. you get butterflies before the game? I've got them now. <laughs> I'm always worried. Can I keep up with the pack? Yeah. So you're not afraid of getting hurt or the oh, contact? No. no, I'm not afraid of the contact at all. The running is the thing that bothers me because I've led kind of a sedentary life for a little while. And, um, you know, it's a matter of getting back into shape. And I have to do that on my own, too, you know, start running and things like that and doing my exercises at home, you know, on the days we don't have practices. And that's the part, you know, that bothers me the worst. No, but I'm not afraid of the contact at all. How do you feel if you make a mistake on the field? Do, you, do the other women, you know, understand? They really do. Honest. Because, you know, I'm, I'm the fattest and the slowest, and people have just been so supportive. I just can't believe it, you know. They don't s scream at me and everything like that, like, because of that. Uh, you know, they just tell me to get in there and, you know, do what I'm supposed to do. You gonna watch the game today? Am I gonna watch the game? No. No? No. What do you think about women playing rugby? I happen to be an MCP. What's that mean? Male chauvinist pig. Why is that? Women have three functions in life. What's that? What are the three functions in three life? Three functions? Well, the three functions are Kinder, Kirche, and Kusche. What's that? Children, kitchen, and church. Okay, you two hang on to each other tighter. Then you have a feel of when each of you go up. Yeah. That's okay. Kind of grab. You'll stay for what you yeah. do like this. You're, you're not as, as powerful, okay? Okay. And that way you guys could be more able to keep this going. Women want to be good at it. They don't mm -hmm. want to go out and make a fool of themselves. I guess we've been laughed at so much that we just can't bear it anymore. 
and I don't want to go out on that field and be laughed at. And so they want to know everything before they go out there, and there's no way they can know everything. You have to coach them into playing. You have to mm -hmm. pull them and drag them and push, push them, them and kick them, them. <laughs> anything to get them to play that first game. Because Being able to play rugby what took a lot for me because I always sort of cared too much about what other people thought. You go along, you have to have the you know the right kind of clothes to wear so that you fit in with everyone else. And when I decided to play rugby, it was you know off the norm. And I try and convey this to you know some of our patients that that you can be different, that you have to have things that are different to make up your personality. And just playing rugby has made me more self-confident and assured and then I can say, you know, that's part of me, I play rugby. I don't want to be a housewife, I just want to be a whore, I'd rather hang around Piccadilly Underground, living up the ends of a high boy, I don't want to moan up the ass, I won't work my fingers to the bone, I'd rather stay in Milwaukee, Mary, Mary, Milwaukee.
We're both poets from Chicago, and uh, this is a poem for Pilsen. I wrote this when I was living here last year, oh. and it's dedicated to uh, Pilsen and the Plan 21 program. All right. Oh. Late night sounds and smells entice, and we prowl like cats through Pilsen sidewalk and alleys. The night wind scatters paper and other debris like malignant leaves through the gutters, and broken glass glitter like old discarded jewels under the harsh street lights, turning vacant lots into family treasure chests. Families all gather on the front stoops, cooling their hot and tired bodies in the night air, watching the wet children run in the spray of the pumps while Santana blasts from the car radios of the dude who's dancing place to the music, embroidering colorful stories, punctuating every other motherfucker with a drag from a cigarette and a gulp of cold beer, coolly eyeing the traffic passing by. A sweet mariachi melody drifts out from a bar on the corner, wrapping eyes in silken strands of harmonies, and a longing beats itself against the ribs, threatening to break out to you. They say you're a slum, Pilsen. Mexican barrio, a halfway house for the upwardly mobile, a dumping ground for the terminal souls that look for hope in a fix or a bottle. You are redlined in the sleep polyestered offices in downtown, talking shit about you being a high risk area, and yet the pimps in Gang 21 are busy making plans to dress you up and sell you to the Johns that are bored of suburban living, wanting excitement without sacrificing convenience. Yeah. Your right. past crumbles in ruins along the tracks that twist through your heart like steel veins, and deep rumbles of the elevated trains echo the unrest in the minds of the soon-to-be displaced, their anger and pride splashed in violent colors, trying vainly to hide the decaying walls, and the long, dead, painted heroes call silently for revolution. Night surrenders to the gold streaks on the horizon, washing the old buildings in its pale light. Blaring car horns splinter the morning stillness, and the pulse of your lifeblood quickens as the men in dark clothes and the patient women huddle like quiet flocks of blackbirds, waiting for the buses to take them to the slaughterhouse of color, blind, greed that will decide your future, Pilsen. We're selling some t-shirts, who had his uh, t-shirts that come with the, from the festival. They're done by uh, the same person, people who did the poster. And uh, they're selling very well. They come in medium, large, and uh, we're very proud of the way they came out. How do you feel about the festival? I think it's great. I think it's turning out really nice. Really nice. I think we've got a lot of cooperation by uh, all the community groups and the people are coming out and it's still early. It's still early. Now we're, we're selling some t-shirts, uh, Femex t-shirts, Zapata with a, with a gas pump instead of a gun. And uh, we have right, the, right here the mural that we're going to be painting, uh, not the mural, but one of the sketches of the mural that we're going to be painting at Benito Juarez High School. I just graduated from my master's and I've been working in Casas Clan and the community for the last three years. I started a ceramics workshop over there and right now I'm trying to uh, build the community center um, in Casas Clan as a cultural center. It's very, I'm very unhappy to see that in most of the work I'm doing, there isn't that many women, but uh, we're trying to start changing that and a lot of the women that are, well, a lot of the little girls that are coming to my class are seeing that as a sample and, you know, they see that it can be done. So hopefully in a few years that will be changed. So what do you think about a fair like this for women? Like it. It's pretty good. It's, I didn't think it was going to turn out that good, but now I see it for a lot of people. 
It's all right, still, I don't have a lot of fun here. <laughs> well, I think that this is really the first major cultural event that is woman defined. And I'm real excited about it, and I hope that it won't be the last, and in fact, we'll be ready next year. <laughs> what do you think the other people in the community think about a woman's festival? Well, the feedback that we've gotten so far is really good. Um, they seem to think that it's a really good thing. They feel as though Mujeres Latinas in Acción is really doing something now, you know. They say, oh, this is really something, and who's doing it? And they're really excited about it, and I've been hearing that. I've been walking up and down. So I think that uh, the community response has been pretty good. I know when we told just the people on this block, they were pretty excited about it, you know. And I figured, I was a little worried because I figured, gee, people aren't going to want, you know, all this stuff in front of their houses. But they were really pretty excited about it. When Allende's government was overthrown in Chile by the fascist right wing, um, women in this particular town started going to inquire the government as to the whereabouts of their son, whether they were jailed or whether they were dead, you know, and the government ignored them. And every day they would come to this Plaza de Mayo asking for their sons till people started thinking they were crazy, started calling them crazy, and they became the crazy women from the Plaza de Mayo. And this is written in dedication to them. Me llaman la loca de Plaza de Mayo. Every day I go looking for my son, a prisoner of a treacherous tyranny, or maybe he lies rotting in an unknown grave. And I, every day, I go down to the plaza and raise my voice in chorus with the others that come. Maldito asesinos, give us our sons. Tell us what is their crime, what have they done? And they laugh at us, call us crazy for wanting to know. I am crazy because I want to know the faith of my son whose only crime was to say that he was hungry. I am crazy because he raged against the injustice of it, watching us die slowly, having no dreams of our own to nourish us. I am crazy because I love this boy, flesh of my womb, who did the only thing a man with nothing left but his dignity can do. And they laugh at me those bloated jackals glutted with the blood of my offspring, dazed with their power and so blissfully unaware that this crazy woman whom they ridicule and scorn carries deep within her womb the beginnings of their execution and the end of their predatory rule. Me llaman la loca. Mujeres como yo, mujeres como yo, con una bandera en el pecho, fuerte como piel de coco, con el diablo por dentro, como bendición pura, sin miedo ser fresca, palabra por palabra, merezco respeto. Mujeres como yo, un ángel fantasma, el ritmo de un condenado palo de palma que baila con el viento, un pétalo, mancha de guineo, mancha de guineo, cuando menos crees el efecto ligero sin sus pechos. Mujeres como yo, machúa y bruta, cruda sin gracia al color rosa, que no se antoja tener un lápiz de labio, al contrario, al contrario, que solo siente los colores bellos de su piel café, el espíritu por dentro se baña con flores blancas. La gracia de una mujer, mujer verdadera, sin seno, sin cintura, Pero aquella bandera en su pecho, el diablo por dentro, espíritus en muerte, se baña con flores blancas. Mujeres como yo, la mujer fuerte, dura, como una montaña, la cosita más femenina, la cosita más femenina. Bueno, como un condenado palo de palma, su alma baila el ritmo del viento, la mancha de guineo con ligero efecto.
Well, thank you, everyone. Um, Eleanor, I'm going to try to unmute. Oh, got, you got it. <laughs> You're an expert now. Um, that was a really wonderful screening. I'm sorry, my cat is just going to do this, but um, <laughs> he's got to participate. Um, I, I guess I'll just start it off by asking you a question. And while I'm saying that, then um, everyone can think of their questions um, and be ready to jump in. And again, you can type them in the chat or you can um, virtually raise your hand or, or physically raise your hand. Um, so I was just wondering, like, what was the story of how you got into video? How did you find out about it? And how did you sort of realize it was gonna be this inspiring tool for, for doing um, you know, fem we're dealing with feminist issues. Uh, well, I had a background in art and was very interested in film when I came to Chicago in 1965 uh, from Texas, where I grew up. And um, uh, in the early 70s, I got involved with uh, a, a woman's group in Chicago called Women Against Rape. And of course, at that moment, at the beginning of the 70s women's movement, women were organizing to um, uh, fight against the uh, uh, cultural attitudes and the institutions that uh, kept women from having uh, full and equal access to uh, American life. And rape was an issue that was foremost uh, at the time um, because uh, uh, there were women who, by the in the 60s, 60s had gone to college and coming out of that experience, there were more women going and uh, doing research and entering academic fields and entering fields of journalism and other fields and uh, realized that uh, the institution, the, the uh, justice, criminal justice system, uh, the hospitals, uh, cultural attitudes about women and rape were really uh, making it very difficult for women to uh, reach their full potential in society. So Women Against Rape organized to bring about change in the cultural attitudes and the uh, institutions like the criminal um, justice system and the way women were treated uh, when they went to uh, hospitals to report rape. Um, this group, um, was uh, hosted by the Loop Center YWCA. And uh, the Loop uh, YWCA got a grant to train lay advocates to go to court with rape victims. And as part of that grant, they got early video equipment, the first Porta Pack, which was the first portable equipment um, uh, introduced by Sony. Uh, and it was just becoming really available uh, in the early 1970s. And so since the Y had this equipment, uh, I immediately gravitated to using it. And um, um, there was a group of uh, women at the Y, some uh, staff members uh, who were interested in learning it and learning how to use it and using it to make videotapes, uh, not only to document the activities of the Loop YWCA, but to educate uh, a broader public. And so that's how I got involved. Um, and when we started, we tried to do video in a way that was non-hierarchical. Uh, everybody had a chance to use the camera. We passed the camera around, passed the microphone around. Some people, you know, um, uh, ended up finding they had interest in one thing or another. But in the beginning, we all uh, shared the various roles, and um, that uh, that was exciting. Well, um, I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Um, okay, so one came in via the chat from Russ Lyman. I'm curious about the first Sony equipment. How heavy was it, and how long were the tapes? Okay. Uh, the Sony Porta Pack consisted of three elements a camera, a box-shaped camera that was about that big, uh, a long, long cable that attached to a video recording deck, and we used, uh, you had to mount open reels of half-inch black and white video on the deck, 
uh, kind of like the old tape recorders where you had to manually thread the, the video uh, over the record and, uh, and the video head. Uh, the video recorder itself weighed about 30 pounds. So it did have a leather case with a strap so that you could hang it on your shoulder. And if you were really strong and big, you could hang it on your shoulder and hold the camera and uh, use the camera. Uh, we found it was much easier to have at least two people, someone to carry the recorder and someone uh, working the camera. It was uh, 30 minutes of tape on a reel ordinarily. Right, yes, that Ed was. Editing. Uh, editing was a real issue. The early editing decks were totally manual. There was no um, you know, electronic controller to uh, roll tape back and forth and to uh, create edits at a specified point. You had to do it all on the fly. Uh, and as a result, uh, edits frequently missed, so they would have a jump. Uh, and the electronics uh, uh, were not real stable on that half inch tape. So you frequently had uh, instabilities between edits. So it was all very primitive, but uh, it worked and it did the job. Uh, we were able to get tapes out, uh, not only to small in small group settings and to targeted audiences, but uh, with the help of people like Tom Weinberg and others who uh, in the early video, uh, Chicago Video Makers Coalition, uh, we were able to uh, get some of the work on broadcast television. Uh, and that particular group was a wonderful boon for all of us around the city who were experimenting and learning how to use this early equipment uh, because we met together and learned from each other. And there were some very giving individuals in the group. And I might say some very giving men in the group who really helped uh, the handful of women who were uh, picking up this new medium and trying to use it to make our voices heard. Um, Ginny Neiman asks, where were these videos shown and what was the reaction? Uh, the video were shown, the videos were shown in lots of different places. You have to realize that these were produced for, uh, these were small, for, it was a small format television, half inch. And it was not really immediately suitable for broadcast on over the air television. Uh, so most of the venues were uh, small group settings in, of course, since I was working with the group at the Loop, the Loop YWCA, which was located downtown on 37 South Wabash, uh, that YWC was very active in supporting women in areas of uh, legal issues, health, um, uh, sports, uh, education, work in the workplace, you know, jobs. Uh, so they were constantly wanting programs, uh, having lectures, presentations, uh, and um, um, conferences. And so these tapes were shown at the YWC. They were shared with uh, wives across the metropolitan area. Uh, some of the tapes that we did not the, uh, specifically the ones you saw tonight, but uh, we did tapes relating to women's health. Uh, this, um, we did tapes, uh, we did tape on uh, domestic violence, where a group of uh, women who were victims of domestic violence uh, talked about uh, their, their lives and um, the violence they experienced, and that tape uh, was used not only in small group settings uh, to educate women and uh, others, but it was shown in police departments and in hospital settings to help educate, um, um, you know, people who would uh, interface with victims of uh, domestic abuse. Uh, they were shown at conferences. They were shown also in film festivals, and the tapes were shown in gallery settings and occasionally in uh, museum shows. Uh, and they were used a lot in classrooms in uh, secondary education as well as in university settings. Um, Julia Lesage asks um, if you could describe the community of women video makers at the time. Uh, well, in terms of the why, uh, 
there, there were several women on staff at the Y who of course were involved in uh, women's issues. And um, so uh, I, there was that core group there. Uh, but there were other women who were using uh, the, uh, this small format portable video also. Uh, there were artists, uh, women artists, uh, who were using it uh, as a means of individual expression, of art expression. Uh, there were uh, women journalists, women who came with a background in journalism, either television or print journalism, and were not uh, uh, satisfied with the kind of uh, male hierarchy they experienced and the kind of um, 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 traditional types of journalism uh, that, you know, were in the professional sphere. And so they were exploring new ways of dealing, of, of dealing with journalism. And there were women uh, like Denise Accardi who worked with high school students who were trying to bring video to unserved audiences, including young people. Um, so there was a whole variety uh, coming from different points of view, from either at a, a, the individual artist or the would-be documentarian or the uh, journalist, uh, news reporter. Um, so it's, it was a, a mix and it was a, a very exciting mix too, I have to say. Um, Morel Block asks, were there any organized self-defense efforts for women that grew out of that rape video? Well, the Y, of course, was teaching classes, and there was, uh, there was an organization uh, that supported women self-defense in, uh, instructors, and the instructors that were used at the Y, that, that came to the Y, came from that woman's group. Um, so uh, there was, uh, you know, a movement beyond just uh, the Y. Um, Nathan Boyer asks, how long did the process take from filming to the finished video? Well, that varied a lot, Nathan, I have to tell you. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, all of us in our group, in the Loop YWCA group, when I first started with video, we were volunteers. I mean, there, there were people who were on staff, but they had other responsibilities, so they were not full-time video makers. And I was a volunteer who had a family and a young child at home. So I was a part-time volunteer also. And uh, so just to give you an idea, and also we were learning. It took us a while to learn how to do this. Uh, so it was a slow process. We actually began shooting the street interviews on the self-defense tape in the very at late 1974 right at the end of 1974. And then we worked on it through 1975 and started editing at the end of 1975. And I think the actual final edit was finished, you know, in the beginning of 76. So it took a long time. Uh, I think the rugby women tape uh, took less than 12 months. You know, started shooting, I think at the end of 70, Seven and finished it in seventy-eight. Um, the, the of course Mujeres, uh, the the street fair tape, Mujeres Latinas in Acción, uh, that was done in just several months because it was a discrete event that we documented in one day, and then we immediately began editing. And by that time, you notice that we were using color video. So at that time, portable video was evolving so rapidly. Every few months, it seemed like they were coming out with new uh, uh, equipment uh, with um, updated capabilities and expanded capabilities. And uh, so by the time we shot uh, Mujeres Lat uh, yeah, the, the street festival, uh, we had access to a color cassette recorder and camera. It's not like the small camcorders that people in later generations are familiar with. It was also a uh, two unit uh, pack. It had a, a camera, a big camera attached by cable to a big recording deck. 
but it had the advantage of taking three quarter inch tape that was loaded in a cassette. So all you had to do was stick the cassette into the record deck. You didn't have to manually, uh, you know, wind the tape onto the deck. Um, so it, it was easier to use in that respect, but it was heavier. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the, most of the projects were not done real quickly, except uh, occasionally we would come across something that we could shoot and finish fairly rapidly. I remember the uh, mail carrier. That was yours, right? Yes. Yeah, Karen Pugh and I did the uh, tape with which we titled Joanne, My Sister the Mail Carrier. Uh, she was not a biological sister to Joanne and I, but we felt like, uh, to Karen and I, but we felt like Joanne was uh, our sister in the struggle. Uh, she was one of the early uh, female mail carriers in a uh, hired to deliver mail in an urban setting. Um, Galen McKinley asks, what has, what is your perspective on how the world has changed for women since the 1970s? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> all you have to do, Galen, as I'm sure you do all the time, <laughs> is turn on the television set and especially PBS and even other channels, you will see women newscasters, you will see women uh, uh, reporters, you will see uh, uh, women in all the technical fields, uh, you'll see women directors, you'll see uh, and uh, women experts uh, being called on uh, for uh, panels and discussions. You would see none of that when I was growing up, absolutely none. And you certainly, even just beginning in the late 60s and even in the early 70s when we started out, uh, this would, uh, you would see very, very few women in any of these roles. And you set, definitely would never see a woman uh, sportscaster or commenting on sports. <laughs> but today, uh, it seems that uh, uh, the things that we started doing way back then have come to fruition or uh, I feel like for the better. Um, Laura Harmeyer asks a sort of related question. Um, when you show these videos in the 70s, what were audience reactions? Did women realize they weren't as helpless as they thought? Were men embarrassed at the male statements? <laughs> uh, both of those things were true, I think. <laughs> Definitely. Um, Jana Ebel asks, which of the topics were particularly exhausting for you personally, or which were the most fun to cover? They were all exhausting, but they were all incredibly fun and exciting. <laughs> um, there was a follow-up that I had forgotten to say. Russ Lyman responded that he was amazed at the rugby shots and he felt like he was part of the action given the equipment that could have not, not have been easy. Uh, thank you. I appreciate your, your commenting on that. Uh, it, it was not easy, but as I said, uh, it, was, it was very exciting and uh, we were so determined and uh, we just jumped in and did it. And when I look at those tapes now, uh, I often wonder how in the heck we did it. <laughs> my shooting team then was myself and one other person who was handling the mic and we traded off and on. Um, Skip Blumberg wants to know, um, where are these videos now? Are there more? How many? Are there any ways to see them? Uh, there are more, uh, and I am in the process right now of getting everything digitized, and I hope to have it in the Media Burn video archive soon. Media Burn uh, uh, will have some of them soon. And there uh, are a few. Uh, the Festival de Mujeres is already available to watch in full as part of an Image Union broadcast, but I think that we can maybe, in our when we send out a recap email, we can provide some links to what already is there. There are a few, I think, um, 
there's a few pieces that were on this program image union it was a, a local chicago show that showed independent work that some of them are already available I also on the uh, video makers uh, uh show that we put together what yeah Slice video of chicago right no slices of chicago i yeah. think that i think that's in on uh in in midi burn now isn't it sir yeah what's it called slices of chicago right the first one it's yeah an hour. yeah uh, it was broadcast on uh, channel 44. Uh, I one comment. I'm sorry. Yeah, one comment I like to make about that: uh, the videos that you can see on Media Burn right now, because they were included in uh, compilation programs like Slices of Chicago and like uh, Image Union, and I was thrilled to have them. I mean, it was very exciting to have them on those programs and actually be able to see them on broadcast television. But in terms of viewing them now on the Media Berm website, they are many generations down from the original and are streamed so that they don't look as good <laughs> in terms of oh. visual quality as they will look when I get uh, new digital versions uh, deposited in the archive and they can be streamed from new digital versions. Um, Julia Lesage asks, have you made cell phone videos? Um, oops, it just scrolled down. How does that feel to you to make cell phone videos if you have? <laughs> I have to tell you that uh, now that I'm in my eighth, gen uh, eighth decade, <laughs> I'm not doing video anymore. <laughs> uh, although now that's not true. I take that back. Uh, my husband, Wayne Boyer, and I have done a, a, a bit of pro bono video uh, in a small community in Wisconsin where uh, we spend a lot of time, especially in the summers. And we've done some uh, pieces for local uh, groups, uh, nonprofit arts groups and uh, community groups in that particular little town. Uh, but uh, generally I don't uh, do video and uh, anymore. Uh, I love watching it, though. Nicole American asks, um, did you save outtakes? Uh, there, there were some outtakes. Uh, a lot, many of the tapes that we shot during the, uh, during, for the Loop YWCA video project in the early seven, I mean, the, the mid and late 70s, a lot of that, of course, was done only on the half-inch open reel black and white tape. And as some of you know, that tape has totally disintegrated or pretty much disintegrated. And uh, the equipment is difficult to find to play it on. So it's pretty much lost. And a lot of the tapes we did were not edited. Uh, they were simply documentary records of presentations or lectures or conferences. And they were housed at the Y, and I have no idea where they went. Uh, some of the edited tapes, uh, I kept some of the outtakes and some of the original footage, uh, but most of that is gone also. Uh, and um, there's very little of the original stuff left. Uh, I do have, uh, you know, copies of the edited tapes, which were shot on half inch and then edited on three quarter inch and then a number of years ago, I transferred a lot of it to DV tape when we got into digital video. And then from the DV tape, that is what uh, we are now making digital uh, uh, versions. Uh, Marianne Johnson asks, how did the experience of creating these videos affect your later life? Did you continue with this type, kind of work after the 1970s? Um, I have not been uh, totally involved as a, an activist. Uh, I did, it did inform me in my later years, especially uh, uh, in terms of the women's spirituality movement. Um, I was involved with a number of women's spirituality groups and did a little bit of video uh, of some of our um, um, 
rituals and uh, celebrations. Um, of course, it has uh, affected uh, my life totally in terms of my relationships with other people and, um, you know, where I've spent my uh, energy in uh, trying to bring understanding of women and women's issues. Karen Pugh asks, you've made so many different tapes. Can you describe how you chose your subjects and topics? Boy, that's a hard question. It just seemed to me that I finished one tape and there was something popping up that needed to be done. <laughs> uh, and of course, there was always the issue of, uh, are you going to be able to have access and are you going to be able to get enough money to do it? Uh, the money issue uh, was an issue. Uh, you know, to, to make a film, filmmaking is very, very expensive uh, because uh, filmmaking, you, you can't record sound simultaneously with picture and that to get the a finished film, you have to go through all kinds of lab processes, even to just see what you shot first, much less to uh, make prints for editing and then the final editing. And uh, it's very expensive. But uh, the video uh, medium, uh, because you could record sound simultaneously and you had access, you had a tape that would record 30 minutes of picture and sound. Uh, and you could buy a reel of, t of tape for, I don't think, $15 way back then. Uh, uh, production was fairly inexpensive, but you still had to pay to rent editing equipment. And fortunately, our alternative video group in Chicago got together and created uh, something called the Chicago Editing Center, which was uh, you know, funded with grants to provide access to um, low cost editing equipment to members. And uh, so we did have access to editing suites uh, at less than commercial rates. If we had to try to uh, pay commercial rates, it would be impossible to do these things. But uh, because uh, the, vi the alternative video makers in the city banded together and worked together to provide uh, the necessary tools for each other, we were able to make these projects using minimal budgets, but getting money was always an issue. Um, Terry McKinley asks, um, you still love watching video. Is there anything you would recommend or people you follow? Uh, I, I really don't watch that much anymore. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Terry, I wish I could give you a list of fabulous things to watch. Maybe you can give me your list. <laughs> or anyone else there can send me a list. Eleanor Miller asks, what would these videos look like today if the same topics were examined? How would women on the street today respond to the question about going out alone at night? I think it would, uh, they would have a whole different response. Uh, you know, back then, the responses that we got from the people we interviewed on the street, uh, um, at rape was something that was uh, kind of like a hammer held over women's heads. Uh, all of societal, the patriarchal society and all of the cultural attitudes and institutions told women that they were weak that they needed the protection of a man, uh, that their place was in the home, that uh, going out into the world was dangerous. And women grew up believing that they were weak and that they couldn't go out into the world. And they also were taught that anyone who was raped probably invited it because they put themselves in a situation where they enticed the perpetrator. They wore sexy clothes or, or they were in, uh, out someplace by themselves. They were asking for it. And uh, those myths pervaded all of societal institutions, pervaded the criminal justice system, the hospitals, 
so that when a rape victim, if she was, you know, violated uh, uh, and damaged enough, she actually went to a hospital, the personnel frequently uh, wouldn't believe, and they certainly did not take um, um, evidence. They did, there were no rape kits in the hospitals until 1974 when a Chicago woman invented the first rape kit and got it into hospitals so that uh, emergency room personnel could collect evidence. But prior to that, the rape victim reported uh, a rape and tried to take her attacker to the court. Uh, she had to prove, she had to have a witness. She had to have someone to verify that this rape had actually occurred. And uh, the uh, prosecutors could bring up her sexual past history. They could bring up all kinds of things. So women seldom reported rape. And when they did, they were victimized again. And that's uh, where women in the early 70s uh, began to fight back and uh, you know, demand uh, change. And uh, that's when the whole, um, there was a very influential book that came out that brought all the statistics on rape and all of this information together. It was a book by Susan Brown Miller, who was a journalist called, I think it was called um, oh, I can't remember the exact title, but it, uh, it, it explored the myths of rape and uh, uh, it was very powerful um, and very uh, influential book. It started, the, well, it didn't start the movement, but it certainly bolstered the movement that the uh, women uh, had already started. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It was really inspiring to see this work um, that really caused, by you and your colleagues, that really caused a lot of change in our society. Um, and um, if any of you um, missed the beginning, um, we're going to be sending out a link to everyone um, so, to the recording. So if you missed the beginning or you want to share it with your friend or whoever that didn't get to see it, that will be going out tomorrow to everyone who attended. Um, and please join us on future Thursdays for other um, talks with video activists. Um, next Thursday will be Tom Weinberg, and the Thursday after that will be Skip Blumberg. And another Thursday to come will be Susan Milano, and we hope many more to come. So um, thanks again, and um, see you soon.